Yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some current work in progress. Uh, and this is a book with the work the title of Data Communism versus Uber Capitalism. And I'm going to just begin by spe sketching a little bit the argument I made in this book, which is the Uberification of the University. And that's kind of the, the first part of the, the larger Data Communism book uh, abroad, I think. It's a real thing. Um, and so what data communism explores is what neoliberalism's continuing weakening of the socials is going to mean for the future organisation of labour. The book does so by examining those companies that are associated with the emergence of kind of what used to be known as the sharing economy, so Uber, Lyft, Airbnb uh, and so on. Uh, I say used to. Uh, because this term, especially in the UK, has been replaced uh, lately by the wider category of the gig economy. Not least because most people by now are aware that while the sharing economy doesn't involve much sharing really, it does involve an employee-employer relationship uh, in which the flexibility is primarily on one side. However, I'm going to continue to use the, the sharing economy in the book, I might call it the X sharing economy or something like that. But I'm going to kind of hang on to it just for a little while longer. Partly because the gig economy focuses attention mainly on labour regulations and not so much on the psychological and existential factors that are an important part of labouring under digital <laughs> capitalism. But also because I wonder if the implications that these platforms could be used for different purposes for actually sharing and building community, this may be another reason why the term sharing economies fallen slightly out of favour. Now of course similar predatory practices are present in other areas of the business world and you can kind of tell I'm a Sunderland supporter. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm focusing on the sharing economy is because it's here that the implications for workers of this kind of hyper or turbocharged form of capitalism, what we might playfully call uber capitalism, are most apparent. And this is a society in which we're encouraged to become not just what Michel Foucault termed entrepreneurs of the self, but micro entrepreneurs of the self, acting as if we're our own precarious freelance micro entrepreneurs in a context in which we're steadily being deprived of employment rights and public services and social security. So my argument is that our society can be understood as uber capitalist in at least three related senses. In that we're experiencing a historically specific version of neoliberalism that's growing more aggressive in many respects. The prefix uber actually means advanced, irresistible, higher, superior, more powerful. That Uber provides one of the most characteristic examples of this intensified form of deregulated capitalism in which work is becoming low in quality but high in risk and stress. And that a number of Uber leaders, Trump in the US, Farage and the Brexiter in the UK, have arisen and have been able to capitalise on this, on the discontent that this system is spread among the so-called left behind. So the first part of data communism analyses the implications of Uber capitalism for the organisation organization of labour, largely through the prism of those who work and study in the university. And it does so because academics, researchers and students are now being encouraged to become micro-entrepreneurs of themselves. I believe put up there for me, sorry. <laughs> uh, and about their own lives. So even so-called good jobs are being affected. But it also does so because the university provides one of the spaces where the imposition of neoliberalism 
and its emphasis on production and privatisation and the interests of the market is being overtly opposed and struggled over. So in recent years I've been exploring how we can affirmatively, affirmatively disrupt the ways in which we live and work in order to invent a different, more caring future for the university, for the sharing and gig economies and for post-industrial society too. And I've been doing so with a number of different groups and organisations and people, some of whom are in the room. These have operated under names such as Culture Machine and Open Humanities Press and the Centre for Disruptive Media, which is now being kind of disrupted itself into, uh, well, one name for it is the Post Office, but we can talk about that later if you like. And the result has been a series of performative projects Performative in the sense that they're concerned not only with representing or critiquing the world, but also with interacting with the world in order to make things happen. And so data communism is part of one such project. Part of the aim is to affirmatively disrupt platform capitalism, or part of it anyway. And it's this more affirmative aspect of the project addressed in the second part of the book, and that provides 10 speculative mm -hmm. suggestions about how we can go about disrupting the disruptors, disrupting the sharing and gig economies. And they include, well, pressurising the regulators to change the law, say by breaking up the dominance of Uber and Airbnb as the monopoly of Rockefeller's Standard Oil was broken up in the early 20th century. Or this becoming a micro-entrepreneur and demanding for us to be paid for any data that we generate that turns out to be valuable rather than giving it to free to these companies. We could form a data commons using copy far left licences and here workers themselves own the means of production and only prevent use of their work that is not based in the commons. Or we could construct a progressive counter-platform ourselves to rival laws of digital capitalism. And the, the second part of the book ends by arguing for a diverse heterogeneity of such counter-platforms to be built on the same community-managed data commons. And what we then have is a multipolar ecosystem to adopt the theory of Chantal Mousse, made up of a a plurality of different consortia, each with its own membership, each contributing to and drawing from the information and data commons, and each having its own large-scale, collaboratively controlled platform, this allowing it to invent its own singular way of meeting its particular community's needs. And Janelle Orsi offers one suggestion Imagining a home rental platform that could be used to steward resources that belong in the realm of a city-managed commons, which is housing supply, public infrastructure and wealth, and wealth that travellers bring into cities. Imagine that 20 or more large cities collaborate to develop software, Mooning B&B, and then mandate that all short-term rentals be arranged through the municipal platform. Airbnb couldn't compete because use of Airbnb would be illegal. In this way, fees normally collected by Airbnb could stay with the hosts or go to the actual city concerned instead of a few rich entrepreneurs in California. That kind of multipolar system could be interlocked at the level of the collaboratively managed commons, in which different consortia each build their counter platforms. So what Ernesto Leclerc calls chains of equivalence, could this be established between a diversity of political struggles associated with things like education and housing, eco-feminism, public health, water, corporate tax avoidance and so on. And the advantage of interlocking, interlocking this multipolar system at the level of the commons rather than the platforms themselves would also have the advantages the benefit of allowing for a degree of conflict, antagonism and even incommensurability between these different consortia. 
which as you can see is one way of understanding what the common and community, and as I'm going to go and show in a moment, the political actually are. And the university, I suggest, is somewhere that can actually help actualise these alternative modes of being to platform capitalism. There's certainly a strategic case for universities to be made uh, to, for you, to be made for universities to adopt a kind of copy far left approach that Dimitri Kleiner and others have championed. At the moment, probably not news to anybody here, but at the moment universities are fairly mediocre businesses. When it comes to research, for example, they clearly have a product that the corporate sector is keen to exploit commercially. And universities have been encouraged by neoliberal governments to make this product freely available to business on an open access, open data basis for precisely this purpose. At the same time, universities are being pushed to act as for profit businesses in other aspects of their operation in order to compensate for the withdrawal of public funding by the same neoliberal governments. In this respect, Copy Far Left represents a strategic, strategic way for universities to adopt a far more business-like approach towards the knowledge and the research that they generate. Copy Far Left does so by allowing universities to insist that any for-profit businesses wishing to privatise and commercialise their research must pay a decent price for it rather than getting it cheaply or for free is often the case now. At the same time, Copy Far Left ensures that this research and data remains openly available and free to use in the public sphere. So adopting a Copy, left, copy Far Left approach can enable universities to affirmatively disrupt privately owned companies such as LinkedIn and Academia EDU, that have a business model resting on their ability to parasitically trade off publicly funded education and research. As a result, it's capable of providing universities with a means of rendering themselves far less vulnerable to disruption at the hands of neoliberal governments and any future higher education equivalent of Amazon or Uber. But that's not the only thing that's important about working in this kind of non-rivalrous, non-competitive sets of interlocking communities to experiment with new models of non-profit, non-individualistic ownership and production. Going back to Foucault, doing so can also help us to invent a different form of subjectivity to that offered to us by neoliberalism, with its emphasis on atomised, self-centred, individualistic celebrity, competition, Hello. and the generation of large profits for someone else. The first part was the best. It's kind of going to go downhill from here. This is uh, my particular favourite. Uh, the Zizek baby t-shirt. All of which brings me back to the kind of uberfication book and the idea that if we want to affirmatively disrupt the disruptors, We need to disrupt ourselves and the micro-entrepreneurs of our own work and lives that they're leading us to become. Now, most books on platform capitalism would probably stop at this point, and to be honest, many don't even get this far. However, rather than end here, what I want to do is move things in a more philosophical direction. In particular, I want to take uh, three ball shots and Nathan Schneider at the work when they maintain that their platform corporatism should be considered less than an, as an end point and more as a process, as a radical horizon. And from this perspective, a multipolar system of counter platforms might be a step in the right direction. Yes, it currently stands such work <coughs> on alternative platforms, including that of the platform corporatism movement leave some important things unexamined. I hope you can see that. For example, an appreciation of data is obviously crucial as far as the construction of any data commons is concerned. 
But if we examine the word data, we see it has its English origins as the plural of the Latin, Latin word datum. And the latter means a proposition that's assumed, given, or taken for granted, upon which a theoretical framework can be constructed, or a conclusion drawn as a result of reasoning or calculation. So the etymology of the word data, this raises an important question for the idea of data communism. What are some of the datum points at risk of being assumed and taken for granted when we construct such theories about data and the digital. For me, they include the digital itself, which in many ways is now an irrelevant attribute, given that nearly all media involves becoming with digital information processes, even a paper, print on paper book like this. Other data points are the human, technology, the printed texts, the network and copyright. For example, who does the measuring when it comes to data and who's this measuring for? Well, conventionally, it's the human subject. It's people, as you can see here, who are the presumed viewers of data visualisations. So these visualisations contain an implicit humanism. With what is the measuring performed? With technology and tools seen as separate from the human. How are the measurements, the data recorded, published and disseminated? By print texts and computerised information networks. And how is their circulation controlled? It's controlled through copyright. So just as important as generating a resilient economic model, in my view, is the way that the development of such a multipolar system of counter platforms provides us with an opportunity to rethink certain fundamental concepts that is embedded in ideas of the commons and the data commons as they are in 21st century society in general. For me, the, for me these data points include, as we can see here, liberalism, humanism, freedom, democracy, community, even the commons itself. Although they underpin many movements concerned with developing alternative platforms, these concepts are rarely addressed. Instead, it's assumed that we all more or less know what we mean by democracy, freedom, community and so on. Nevertheless, it's important that we examine them. If movements for alternatives to platform capitalism, such as platform cooperatism, don't do so, the problem is there's every likelihood they'll end up merely repeating the difficulties, the problems, the issues that they're supposed to be offering a progressive response to. So what I do in the third part of the book is I carry out a philosophical investigation of these concepts. And for helping that, I return to a thinker whose political philosophy I draw on in part two to articulate a view of the world of Counter platforms as a pluriverse, plur as you see Chantal move. Having said that, I proceed in the manner of Muth's own method of tracing some of the most fertile ideas within a given tradition, but almost almost always at the limits or from, let's say, heterodox positions. In this way, I try to think Muth with against Muth. So I'm kind of saying this so that if the following answer seems a little bit heterodox, too concerned of establishing a system of alternative platform communities, we well can see why. So, because this is a philosophical, philosophically, uh, philosophical technology group, I thought I'd kind of go through some of these philosophical issues mm -hmm. and some of these dating points. I'm not going to get through all of them, but I'll get through a few of them. So, if we turn to the first three, liberalism, humanism and freedom. So reading the philosopher Carl Schmitt against himself, Muth argues that the political can be understood only in the context of a friend-enemy grouping. By showing every consensus is based on an act of exclusion, Schmitt, for her, reveals the impossibility of a fully inclusive, rational consensus. And this is because of what Muth calls the constitutive outside. Where we're, 
by we're always dealing with the creation of a we, which exists only by the demarcation of a they. Rabbit feminists, welfare recipients, religious extremists, undocumented <coughs> economic migrants. So the third sense of uber-capitalism I refer to, that concerning uber-leaders uber who capitalise on the fear and discontent that this system's spread amongst those left behind. It's a friend-enemy relation that's being played out between globalists and nationalists. So witness the hostility expressed for Theresa May's rich citizens of nowhere, the global metropolitan liberal elite that apparently includes the university. Now for MOOF, we can never achieve peace, not within a society, nor between societies. And I can realise some people are going to find this advocating on my part of conflict with regard to the relation between different platform consortia. It's a bit odd, it's a bit counterintuitive. After all, that idea of people living together in unity is a fantasy that underpins many attempts to portray platform cooperatism and the commons as politically progressive alternatives to data capitalism. Yet it's important not to see this irreducibility, irreducibility of conflict as a purely negative thing, as it is by liberal thought, which has one of its tenets, the rationalist belief in the availability of a universal consensus. For MOVE, this denial of the antagonistic dimension of the political means that for all its emphasis on freedom as inalienable, as we saw here, as well, the political complement to blind spot or datum point for liberalism. That said, even though I'm using it to show how the uber capitalist disruptors of Silicon Valley can themselves be disrupted, Moose for that philosophy for me is not actually political. I'd even go so far as to say it's anti political. We can see this from her attempt to domesticate the conflict and violence which, following Smith, she regards as inherent to the political. Now, as I'm sure some of you will know, the main question of dem democratic politics for MOVE is not how to eliminate issues to do with power and conflict so we end up in a state of perpetual peace, Kantian or otherwise. The question is rather. How can power and conflict assume a form that's compatible with democratic values? And a pluralistic democracy can only achieve this through the establishment of a set of institutions by which domination and violence can be limited and contested. Ruth thus identifies two different forms in which conflict can emer and emerge, antagonism and agonism. So while antagonism is a we-they relation in which the two sides are enemies who do not share any common ground, agonism is a we-they relation where the conflicting parties nevertheless recognise the legitimacy of their opponents. They are adversaries, not enemies. And from this point of view, the goal of democratic politics is to transform antagonism into agonism. In this way, MOOF is able to produce an account of society that acknowledges the irreducibility of conflict, but not to an extent that destroys any democratic political association. My concern is that this leads her to offer a consensual view and vision of society that's almost as free from political conflict as that of the Liberals, Jürgen Habermas and John Rawls, she positions their philosophy against. The MOOF is still drawing a line between those we disagree with, but can nevertheless treat as legitimate opponents, and so include within the democratic political association, and those we cannot treat as legitimate, and therefore remain enemies to be excluded. And I'll leave you to decide which one of those Putin is. Now granted, Muth has no problem placing limits on pluralism, or with the exclusion of what she considers to be illegitimate forms of politics, just so long as it's clear that this is a political decision and not an expression of universal morality. 
It's important to be aware at this point that for MOOF, the political is a decision taken in an undecidable terrain. This is because social relations are not fixed or natural. They're the product of contingent, pragmatic, yet temporary political or economic artic articulations, which means these articulations can be disarticulated and transformed as a result of struggle between the agonistic adversaries and a new form of hegemony established. Hence, she emphasises that the drawing of the frontier between the legitimate and the illegitimate is always a political decision, and that it should therefore always remain open to contestation. My question is, does it? It seems to me that some things are more open to contestation in her philosophy than others. And that a number of the political decisions she makes, in fact, don't remain open to challenge at all. We start with democracy itself. For MOOF, there can be conflict within democracy over the way that institutions constitute, constituted by the Demo Democratic Political Association are to be interpreted, but not over the continuing existence of these institutions in some shape or form. So the nature of these democratic institutions can be contested. What can't be contested is the shared symbolic space, democracy, that's necessary for this contestation to take place. So the democratic system can't be replaced by a, a communist, communist one for her, for example. Now, I'm not saying that a political decision can't be taken with the effect that democracy is the best or least worst system to adopt in a given situation. It can be hard to make a case against sharing economy platforms being democratically owned and controlled by those who work on them. What I am saying is that if the political for MOOF is a decision taken in an undecidable terrain, then such a decision is not available to be taken in her work regarding democracy. Nor would I add in the majority of research today on platform corporatism. In both cases, this kind of decision is decided in advance in favour of democracy. I've got to apologise in advance for this. It's the lowest of the law, having a Garfield cartoon, but finding a slide that has you know, a critical take on hegemony is not really, it's not easy. Mm. So this brings me to the next, don't photograph that, Jonathan. <laughs> this brings me to the next of MOOF's unchallengeable decisions, that political is always hegemonic. Now I agree that political antagonism is ineradical, to the extent we shouldn't be searching for complete reconciliation between the various conflicting parties in either democracy or data communism. But does that mean that the political always takes a hegematic, hegemonic form? After all, hegemony is not universal, it's a specific form of politics. Moreover, if the political really is a decision taken in an undecidable terrain, how is it the decision MOOF takes is always the same? No matter what the contingent context, the political for, for her has to do with the structuring of hegemonic relations, the establishment of a set of democratic institutions by which domination and violence can be limited, and the transformation of antagonism into agonism. There's no other decision to be made, it seems. So what it is to be political is a date and point that's not checked by no. And we can see this quite clearly from our reading of Occupy. They may be collective movements, yet the lack of what she considers a real political strategy means Occupy is for her liberal. Mm. The only way a move can rescue Occupy from the charge of liberalism is by suggesting that these movements, along with Cyrus and Greece, be interpreted according to, to her own pre-decided theoretical framework. So the process associated with Occupy and Syriza are to be understood for her as a call for a radicalisation of liberal democratic institutions. A move to emphasis on the importance of radicalising liberal democratic institutions rather than rejecting them to, to organise new forms of common and the commons outside the dominant capitalist structures is interesting in this context for me for two reasons. It's interesting because of the similarity to the efforts of platform cooperatism 
to engage with democracy in its digital platforms, so as to organise new forms of the common inside capitalism structures. But it's also interesting because it's another place where the anti-political nature of MOVE's philosophy can be revealed by tracing it to its logical conclusions. So, for example, MOVE goes to great pains to contrast her strategy of engagement with to the strategy of withdrawal from that's inspired by the Italian Autonomia movement and theorised by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri and Paolo Verno. And the latter strategy calls for, an, calls for an exodus from the state and political institutions and a rejection of representative democracy. And certainly the failure to radicalise liberal democratic institutions by the so-called exodus theorists in favour of establishing places outside them where the common can be achieved, does leave their work vulnerable to hegemonic political economic articulations by non-progressive forces. So let's take one of the associated blind spots in the theoretical framework of Hart, Negri and Vernon. And this concerns the main liberal democratic institution through which most of us come into contact with their political philosophy, namely the scholarly publishing industry. Rather than either deserting this industry, this institution, or actively engaging with it in order to radicalise it, these neo-Marxist theorists remain very much a passive part of it. They may advocate a politics of the commons and commoning and communism, yet little of this politics impacts on the political decisions they make regarding their own practices as authors and theorists. Instead, Liberal humanist ideas of individual proprietorial authorship, copyright, originality, the proper noun or name, the linear book, and the fixed and finishable object continue to function as taken for granted datum points in their work. The result sees these theories supporting aggressive, profit maximising capitalist publishing companies such as Amazon, in the case of Declaration here, and Penguin, Random House, in the case of Multitude. It's not just the Italian autonomists who can be considered liberal thanks to their way of doing things, however. Explaining why political activists fail to understand the importance of the institutional dimension, move again rights of liberals and liberalism, that they do not recognise the importance of collective movements, neither do they recognise antagonism. But if this is the case, are the majority of academics, certainly in the humanities, not liberals too? Do they not likewise fail to A, recognise the importance of acting collectively in how they do things, thanks to their methodological individualism, and B, fail to engage an, uh, antagonistically with the existing institution of the scholarly publishing industry, or that other institution with which they're closely associated? the university, in order for the articulations of the existing playing field and its manufactured common sense to be disarticulated, transformed and re-articulated. And it's at this point that we come back to thinking with MOVE against MOVE. For all this raises the question is whether MOVE too, who like Hart, Negri and Vernal, publishes with the intellectual property thugs at Versailles, there's a flawed understanding of the political. She may contrast her strategy of engagement with to the strategy of withdrawal from that's theorised by the Italian exodus theorists. Yet how different is Mouffe herself when it comes to radicalising the key liberal democratic institutions with which she, like them, is involved. But a new form of hegemony can be established here too. And as I showed earlier, the university is especially important when it comes to engaging with neoliberalism. This is because for many, the university is where the virtuistic entrepreneurial subjectivity that's so important to our current capitalist creative industries was first developed. Hence the SQ of Facebook and Google, and known as the campus. In this respect, supporting data communism as a means of disarticulating and re-articulating the constituted elements of this entrepreneurial subjectivity 
will enable us to develop a counter-hegemonic subjectivity to uber-capitalism's entrepreneur of the self. This radicalising the institution of the university and the activities that go on there, such as the creation, publication and dissemination of scholarship and research. The project, production of subjectivity is certainly of great strategic significance to move. One reason she's interested in civil society is because this is the terrain in which specific forms of subjectivity are constructed. It's also why art and culture are so important for her. Because they provide spaces where the existing configurations of power can be subverted and are alternative to the political current symbolic ordering of the social relations explored. Critical art can do this through the construction of new identities, new practices, new ways of life. But if subjectivity is so important politically, where does MOOF make a critical intervention by experimenting with the production of such new subjectivities itself? Now, to be fair, MOOF's not a practising artist. She's a university professor, so maybe we can't expect her to be injecting her DNA in the plants. Yet does placing so much emphasis on art in this context act as an excuse for MOOF from using her political philosophy to engage with the key neoliberal institutions with which she's directly involved in order to transform them and their associated practices and dating points. Is this why MOOF's performance of her own identity, her own ways of being and doing, remain that of a liberal humanist? Where is the crucial moment of disarticulation and re-articulation with respect to MOOF's own practice, in which she first disarticulates the common sense notions of what it is to act as a critical academic or political philosopher, e.g. the writing of rational, long-form, individually authored, copyrighted codex print books, published in uniform, multiple copy editions, with a for-profit press such as Verso or Routledge on an all rights reserved basis. And then second, transforms and re-articulates these common sense ways of being and doing to construct new counter-hegemonic practices and subjectivities. Of course, one indication of the kind of thing that's possible in this respect is provided by Occupy, along with the Black Lives Matter, Dakota Standing Rock Sioux and other protests. Can these horizontal, self-organising, leadless movements not be read as providing multiple sites where the existing configurations of power are subverted and alternative possibilities to the current political order explored? Admittedly, these movements may not have radicalised the existing institutions themselves, which is what they'd need to at least want to do for MOVE to regard them as political and not liberal. However, she acknowledges Occupy have experimented with new ways of organising themselves and the conditions of their labour that can lead to the emergence of new subjectivities and provide a terrain for the cultivation of different social relations. So it's disappointing that MOOF is not consistent with her own definition of what it is to be political and does not approach movements such as Occupy in terms of a decision to be taken in an undecidable terrain. But doing so will provide her with an opportunity to actually examine the, those data points for which she measures how near such movements are to having a real political strategy. In the process, you could take on board and assume some of the implications of their experiments with collectivity and mutuality together with decentralised, anti-individualistic forms of organisation and leadership. A, for the institutions of the university and the scholarly publishing industry, but B, also for our own subjectivity. Instead of we see MOOF insists Occupy be apprehended through our own pre-decided theoretical framework. As a result, rather than opening herself to being influenced by such experiments, to explore the construction of new subjectivities that subvert the existing configurations of power regarding what it is to be a political theorist, Muth's 
philosophical oeuvre, though radical in content, remains traditional and liberal in practice. It's primarily about promoting, positioning her in individual authorial subjectivity in the existing institutional playing field as a virtuistic theorist, along with a unique political philosophy in relation to that of a number of other such thinkers, Schmidt, Rawls, Habermas, Bernal. Which is why no matter how undecidable the terrain, Occupy, Cyrisa, Podemos, her response is always the same. Everything explained in terms of her original theory of hegemony antagonism. So that's a rough, quick reading through how liberalism, democracy and subjectivity act as dating points in the neoliberal age. Hopefully you can now see why, in order to move to a post-capitalist society, we need to affirmatively disrupt ourselves and our subjectivities. As university workers, we too have a responsibility to experiment with the production of new practices and new subjectivities, which is kind of what we're doing with, it's not kind of, it is what we're doing with projects such as Open Humanities Press and Living Books and Data Communism. Thank you very much for listening, I appreciate it. You have to speak loud. Yeah, I'll try. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious about the, the broader process in which you see subjectivity as policy. Because you talk about subjectivity being encouraged, being generated. But who or what is doing the encouraging? Who or what is doing the generating? Uh, who is what is generating subjectivity? Sorry, you're saying subjectivity is encouraged. You use a lot of sentences. A certain, a certain form of subjectivity is encouraged, yes. Yeah, but, but by doing things like this. But by you, for what reason, under what circumstances? So in a university, for instance, yeah. particular forms of subjectivity in this sense are encouraged by professional actors with a particular remit to try and increase student employability. Um, yes. I mean, so who would you see as taking this action and why does it fall out of the account? In essence, I'm saying that the language Okay, but I didn't think it, my account was excluding broader issues of power or those issues. What I was talking about was the way that uh, subjectivity is formed, uh, neoliberal subjectivity, uh, liberal subjectivity. I suppose what I'm concerned about in the context of if the university is we often don't like being positioned as neoliberal subjects, so that we do have to talk about uh, employability, and marketing ourselves or making sure our students are employable but then the main way that we have the main defence that we've got of that is falling back on a liberal subjectivity and um, what I'm saying is I'm kind of not happy uh, with either of those and what I'm trying to think through is can we think through another form of subjectivity you know they're all formed by forms of power and connection to the social and political I guess what I'm talking about why MOOCs useful but I don't always use MOOC um, I'm using MOOC here because it's useful for that, but I don't have one big theory. Usually I'm enacting my theory, engaging with other theorists in particular. So my theory will be specific in, in different contexts. So I don't have that kind of big master theory of uh, hegemony or antagonism, as you would say, around uh, MOOC. But her, hers is interesting because she's got a much more uh, antagonistic, conflictual version of society and saying look there's all these different forms of subjectivity happening with them but the problem about that is you can disarticulate them, transform them, we, we can come up with another subjectivity and that's what I'm trying to encourage us to do uh, practically with some of those projects uh, rather than thinking well Matt, if we don't like the neoliberal version then all we can fall back in is the liberal version Any more questions? Thanks. So it's interesting if you have any comments on more traditional forms of resistance, like trade unions. I couldn't hear that in a language that I find about much. But 
Sure. In the workplace, Colleen and Ashley, mm -hmm. it would make sense, I think, to have a look at that issue, and not just academic trade union like UCU or whatever. Sure. But perhaps the kind of joint union activities, not everybody in the university is there. Yeah. A lecturer in the place of shut down with the cleaners, etc. Yeah. So, any comments on that? So, uh, yeah, unions will be part of, you know, could be part of those. Uh, the data commons and the counter platforms, so it would be one way of having that uh, we're talking around in terms of the cow, that kind of chains of equivalence, so they would be part of that, those communities and feeding into that would be one way of um, yeah, doing to make interesting, exciting work. So the idea would be to join up with all these different forms of struggle, yes, and the unions would be one part of that. Hello. Uh, you, when you talk about the cloud, there's like an idea that there's a kind of excess that's, con that's constituted outside of the traditional sure, yeah. sphere of antagonism and the process of transforming mm -hmm. antagonism into agonism is something that he is, you know, is mm -hmm. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'll repeat it when we're <coughs> so facing the wrong way. So that's sorry about that. that. It's all right. The, 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 the transformation of agonism. Yes. It's, sorry, antagonism into agonism is yeah. something which feeds into this kind of liberal subject. And so for you, there's a horizon of excess there, mm -hmm. which is the kind of disruptive force that plays yep. around that yeah, yeah. kind of democratic process. Could you say a little bit about how you think kind of new technologies might affect that moment of excess and how that might okay. yeah, sure. reorganise? Uh, so we're talking about the difference between antagonism and agonism <coughs> in uh, the theory of the coward move, and they have um, they draw a line. Uh, and use that to talk about that constitute of outside and how do digital technologies play out in doing that. Um, okay, so the easiest way to do it would be around projects like this and uh, what they're doing is they're using that moment of disruption uh, and we might move away from using the word disruption but we've kind of used it and re rethought it. They're moving that disruption, uh, moment of disruption where you're changing from one system to another, so you're changing from analog to digital, not to say let's all go for the digital, let's all be on Facebook, let's all tweet, but can we use that moment, and it's the same with the digital university, it's not just about, well, we'll leave the traditional model behind, we might all go over to Future Learn or uh, any of those kind of MOOCs, it's like, can we take that moment of transition and do something that we're excited about, what we think is politically and ethically important? So it's kind of using that. And the point about the cut is, in that moment, is you can disarticulate the analog and then you can rearticulate, but you don't have to rearticulate it as, as an X MOOC. You don't have to rearticulate it as TED or uh, edX or Future Learn. We can rearticulate it in forms that we want to do. So this is what we're trying to do in things like books. So if anyone's got a, a laptop uh, and they want all the OHP books, and probably uh, I think I've got most of mine on there as well, I can let you borrow the stick, you can just download them, you can have them for free. We're not trying to sell them, we're kind of giving those away. Other projects, uh, one that Jonathan is involved in is a, a coffee table book of photography. Uh, but it's online, it's all free, you can go in there, but you can remix it and re-edit it. Uh, we're doing things like you know, rethinking what a lecture is, rethinking what a seminar series is, uh, rethinking what a university is, um, and trying to use that moment to re-articulate them and transform them in more interesting, uh, interesting political ways. Do you want it? Um, so I have two questions. Oh. One is, uh, what do you think and then secondly, could you tell us about the decisions you made when you chose to publish as a sole author of some of your work? Sure, yeah. And uh, what publishers did you choose? Um, yeah, okay. Why? Okay. Uh, right. Um, let me take the, the, the last one. I mean, I don't know about the you know, ref and tech and things. We know they're all about trying to discipline us and make us perform in a certain way and uh, have certain... And it's about turning us into markets and you do feel that universities going the same way the health service. We're going to uh, make it not perform in the criteria that they have so they can make it more, uh, more open to 
commercialization and uh, corporations coming in. Uh, what? How did I choose? Well, most of the projects I do, uh, they're kind of collective, uh, and um, so they're all kind of joint. That some of them are anonymous, some of them aren't. Um, and I understand the question, and uh, on one hand, it looks like a contradiction that I'm standing up here in this. On the other hand, you guys have to take some responsibility for that. You could have invited us as any of those projects, but you don't. You invite one single person that's going to uh, go over that. So we could have been, you know, we could have come as Culture Machine, we could have come as Open Humanities Press, we could have come as uh, Centre for Disruptive Media. Um, but the, the, the second answer for that is one of the things, and it goes back to the other answer, we've got to kind of take the tendencies we have and kind of subvert them a little bit. So we don't do everything at the same time. We do more what's talked about is in terms of quasi-transcendentalism. So you can't change everything all at once, all the time. So sometimes I can, I can question the notion of the author. So one of the projects we did uh, was around piracy, and I published a text in a journal, and then it was there for a short time, and I took it off and I put it on pirate internet sites. And so the only place it's available there is on pirate sites. And it's not available in a journal anymore. Uh, so the only way you can get that text is to pirate it. And anyone can come in, they can change it, they can alter it. And so I'm trying to play there with subjectivity, what it is to be an author, what it is to be a university professor. Uh, can someone still go and publish that? Will it still have the same legitimacy and credibility? So in that one, I can play with the author. Some of the others, I want to play with the identity of the book, or with copyright, or with motions of fixity, and now the publication's been fixed and finished. So I'm trying, I'm not trying to do everything all at the same time. I'm doing a little, you've got to think of it like, uh, you know the Frogger machine at uh, fun fairs, the little frog pops up and you hit it with a hammer, uh, or a mole, whack-a-mole, I think it's also called. So when one mole pops up and it's the author, I hit it with a hammer, and that one goes down, and then copyright comes up, and now I hit that with a hammer, but I can't hit all the moles all at the same time. Was it a four-star article? What, the... the uh, no, but Disney did republish it in Japanese, and so I really don't know whether they kind of knew what was going on. How would you place your best work on a pirate site? What, like you, how, in terms of a new subjectivity, yeah. how do you negotiate with... Yeah, so one of the things people complained about with pirate philosophy, I don't think it's up there, uh, it kind of came out at the same time as uh, as this one. Uh, is yeah, it came out with MIT, and yeah, I'll put MIT, I'll put that in the in the ref. But it was up on a pirate site in a week, uh, within a week. Um, so it's available there. I mean, the ref. I don't think the ref cares whether it's pirated or not. I mean, they just think you've got an MIT book. Uh, my problem with the complaint of that is all that material was already available online. It was just in different forms. So the people are all saying, why is it, you know, why is he published this, this book? But it's because they focus on the book, so they're still giving authority to an author of a published book. They didn't look, well, some of it was in blog posts, some of it was on wikis, some of it was somewhere else, and they didn't see that material was already there in a kind of much more distributed form. They just focused on the book. So they're only going to focus on the book. Sometimes I have to whack that more and say, well, okay, I'm going to publish a book, but if you read the book, it's kind of really pushing at the boundaries and trying to say, you know, what's going on with this. It's trying to do as much as the book and those issues as you can with a traditional press like MIT. Uh, 